Hi, everybody. Um, I do not expect to teach any of you anything. You are all the same as me, CEOs or, or entrepreneurs starting up. Um, and every one of you could have been up here, I'm sure, um, talking about the lessons that you've learned. All I am is willing to share with you our journey, what we've done and why we've done it. And we're not a tech or a software company, so I guess it's a slightly different perspective than some of the messages we've had this morning, because I'm from an industry that is as old as time. But before I really get into, um, I guess, the, the lessons that we've learned, I need to share with you a little bit about who we are um, and why I'm here talking to you. Partners Life was an idea in the middle of 2010. We raised our initial capital, licensed as an insurer in August 2010, and launched to the market in April 2011, so only four years ago. We set a target for our first year of writing $5 million new business annual premium. We achieved $23 million in our first year. We had a, a year five business target of, 20, of 29 million for that year, and our actual in our last year, that's our fourth year, was 46 million. So we've had 79% CAGR since inception, and we've won numerous awards, both industry awards and business awards in that time. We are the only company to have received the maximum five-star rating in the independent advisor survey, the only one of its kind in our industry, every year. Since inception, we are 39% more efficient in terms of costs than the industry average. We have already acquired 101,000 customers. We are the second largest life insurance company in New Zealand for new business market share, and we have raised over $90 million in shareholder equity in that time. So that's a snapshot of partners' life as we exist today. And I didn't really want to, um, to show off, although maybe just a little bit, but what I wanted to do is demonstrate why um, Conference probably thought we had a story that you might be interested in talking about. And now I want to talk to you about how you plan for this level of success. And the truth is, you simply couldn't plan for this level of success. And in fact, if I'd said when we started, we need enough capital because we are going to be the second largest life company writing 46 million a year by year four, I would have been laughed out of town. I would have thought I was delusional. <laughs> but also, there is no one who would have believed that this was possible. So how did we plan? <laughs> For us, there were some not negotiables, which we're going to form the backbone of the organisation we plan to build. These were the themes upon which we intended to attract shareholders to our business, customers, distributors and staff, and on which they could rely on us to consistently be. These are the key components that drive our decision making, and it's the answers to these questions that we plan to be consistent with over the long term. So this, the answers to these questions are our long-term plan. So our purpose, as a life insurer, we exist to provide financial support for New Zealand families and businesses when unexpected health events interfere with their ability to fund themselves. In our own words, we describe it as we do good things for New Zealanders at the worst of times in their lives. That's why we exist. Why us? Why does New Zealand need partners' life to do that for them? Well, we saw that we had a very long history of building, growing, and leading the New Zealand life insurance industry, and that history spans over 30 years. My history, I'm the founder or the founding employee of the three largest life companies now in New Zealand. The sins of my past are there for all to see. A 33-year history, so I couldn't have made too many mistakes in that time. But what it also does is I have a 33-year relationship with the industry and with all the key players in the industry, 
and all the key distributors in the industry. Yeah? So I knew that for us as an organization, we could bring that to the table. What I believe we've done in every other company that I've been involved in, and certainly in this company, is that we bring the standard to the industry for which all competitors need to benchmark themselves against, and that our job is to make that benchmark high. That's why us. In terms of our values, our values are innovation, collaboration, credibility, and fairness. And everyone in our organization knows that. In terms of our philosophies, we share the value that we create with all of our partners. And in fact, it's reflected in our name. That's where the name Partners Life came from. And in our logo, which you can see on the screen, the little green looks like a deconstructed tennis ball, which is in fact a Maori-inspired design showing the sums of all the parts coming together to form a whole. And how do we do that? We reward customers financially for long-term loyalty. We reward our advisors, our distributors, who are independent of us, but we still reward them for the value they help to drive for our shareholders. We reward our staff through incentives. In effect, we have signed on shareholders to the company who have agreed to share some of their value with all of those other partners in order to achieve higher value for all of us. And in terms of our culture, we describe ourselves as restless, agile, adaptable, curious, analytical, creative, demanding, accountable, down-to-earth, Kiwi, and resilient. Finally, once we'd planned the why and the who, why are we here and who are we, we then needed to plan the what. And for us, there was a number of what's, what we wanted to be, and there was one what not, what we definitely would not be. So we intended to become the most valuable and valued life insurance company in New Zealand by any measure. So somebody talked about if you want to be world class, you have to be world class at everything. So for us, we intended to have the best growth in share price for shareholders, the highest profitability, the highest product value, the highest employee engagement scores, customer satisfaction, brand awareness, net promoter score, customer retention, and efficiency measurement. We intend to build what is the model template for how a successful life insurance business should be built globally. We don't see any reason why New Zealand can't be that business that is, is a showcase and the way in which this should be done going forward. We have elected to be the primary catalyst to closing the underinsurance gap in New Zealand. We are the worst in the OECD in terms of the amount of insurance that individuals have on their own lives. That is the protection that they have in case bad things happen to them. And it's our mission to close that gap so that New Zealanders are protected when they need it. And that puts a huge amount of money back into the New Zealand economy if we get that right. And the one thing we will not be, we are determined not to ever be, is we will not be a business that creates a legacy. And that's not just about having modern systems that allow you to adapt, but it's about having modern people <laughs> who allow you to adapt, and challenging processes, especially in an industry that is as old as time. Yeah. To achieve these what's, and to avoid the what not, we know we simply cannot just do the same thing as our competitors, or even the same thing that we have done previously, and then expect different results. To be more valuable and more valued than our competitors, to be the template life insurer globally, to influence the mass behavior of New Zealand consumers, to change that gap, and to remain agile while we do so, we have to disrupt the industry. 
So once we had the answers to the why, the who, and the what, then we could plan the tactics. We use all of our intellectual firepower and the experience of our management team, our staff and our directors, to determine how best to answer these questions. And these answers, the answers to these questions, effectively form what you would typically consider to be a medium to long-term strategic plan. You know, that lovely document that everybody writes up and says this is the path that we're going to follow for the next five to ten years. Traditionally, because it takes time to build the infrastructure to deliver against these desired answers, there's often not a lot of appetite in organisations to revisit these questions in the short term. But for Partners Life, we saw that in order to disrupt the industry, we also had to be prepared to disrupt ourselves. Whatever answers we were coming up with today was based on what we collectively know today. And it needs to be re-challenged whenever we learn something new. Whether that be emerging experience gaps between what we expected to happen and what's actually happening. Whether it's new technology options that are flying at us. Whether it's competitive initiatives where we go, actually, this is a really good idea. Yeah, rather than, oh, no, it's terrible. It's come from a competitor. It can't be good. We have to look at distribution initiatives because the way in which products are distributed is changing rapidly. We have to look at what's happening in the rest of the world. Random staff ideas need to have a place where they can be heard. We recognise that we need to be prepared to stop and consider whether we should or could change these plans whenever an opportunity or a hurdle presented itself. Now, I'm not talking about chasing every ghost. You can chase a lot of ghosts and never do anything if you do that. But I also mean not single-mindedly walking past every newly opened door because you've got a goal that says, this is my plan, and this is the next step, and the next step. So it requires you to see the open door and go, hang on a minute, let me just recheck. Is this still the plan that we want to follow? So I just wanted to share with you some of the tactical plans that we decided on before we started that have proven themselves over the past four years. So they remain a part of the plan going forward. So our product philosophy when we started was, we will be the best product at competitive price. And how we, did we do that? We had to research every single feature and benefit in every product in the marketplace and then match the best feature and benefit. Uh, feature and benefit to create that product and then make that a competitive price. Now, if you have the best product as determined by independent research at a competitive price in our industry, not only do people want to sell your product to their customers, it's very hard not to sell our product to their customers and justify that decision. So that product strategy has served us extremely well and will continue to serve us well. In terms of sharing the value with all parties, we offer an increase in client loyalty discount to our clients for the longer they stay with us. We are giving away profitability in order to retain customers for the long term. So even though we're already competitive when they buy, we make damn sure that over time they get increasing amounts of value for staying with us. We reward our advisors as shareholders, as I said, even though they're independent and they're not tied. And we do so through a deferred commission scheme where they get additional wealth, which matches the increase in our share price. So they have some reward for sticking with us as well. In terms of our underwriting revolution, in our industry, underwriters have always almost been gods. So they have held the decisions around how much we charge a client or whether we accept them in their hands. For the distributors, they are the gatekeeper to whether they get paid or not and how quickly they get paid. Yeah? To, the, to the company, they are the people deciding our risk profile. Yeah? And so they kind of held the industry to ransom and they're very expensive people. Right? They're very expensive resource and you usually need a lot of them. We have revolutionised the way underwriters do their job. So we recruit 
experts out of the industry for their experience and they walk into our business and realize very quickly they haven't got a clue how to do their job. And I'll give you an example. We've stripped out every basic process, every process that a computer can make a decision quickly because it's rule-based, and every uh, process that can be automated. So when an underwriter in another company comes into work, they might spend a day looking at 10 cases, two of which are really easy, two of which you can't do anything with yet because you have to go off and get some medical evidence, uh, a couple of medium and then a couple of really meaty ones, hard ones. And then I go home and come back the next day and do similarly. When you're an underwriter in our business, you only see the tough ones because we don't need an underwriter to look at all the other stuff. That's easy. So all day long, you are looking at really hard cases. First thing that underwriters say when they come to our business is you've got a lot more sick people <laughs> than the companies we worked for before. No, you're just only looking at the sick people. <laughs> From a career point of view, if what you really love is getting involved in the medical side of things, and that's really interesting, this is a fantastic career opportunity for you. You don't have any admin to do. You don't have to look at the, you know, the basic ones which you could do with your eyes closed. You're getting the meaty stuff. But it's a significant change for them. What it means from a career point of view is they are far more valuable individually to us than underwriters are in other organisations, and, and I'll show you why. Our nearest competitor who writes a similar amount of new business for us has 60 underwriters. We have 20. That's the difference when you revolutionize it. So every one of those 20 people that do it our way are worth so much more to us. They're worth a lot to our competitors too, but you try convincing someone who works this way now to go back to that. Yeah? So from a retention and a career satisfaction point of view, amazing to us as well. When we started, can you hear me? Sorry. When we started, we made a decision that we would only allow distributors to deal with us online quotes. That means if they wanted to, to quote for a client on a premium, it had to be online. There was no local software that they could use or a rate cards that they could use. They had to quote online. We had a huge amount of pushback because we're the only company doing that, huge amounts. We had people saying, we're not going to do business with you if you don't give us what everybody else does. But we had a vision that said, if every time they do a quote, it is our application software that's doing the quote, not some local version which they forgot to update or uh, et cetera. So the premiums always match, then that's amazingly advantageous to the broker because they never get the premium wrong. And now, when they decide that that's the quote that we want to go with, it just sucks straight back into our back office. Nobody has to key anything. And now, we can also take existing policies, they get it into their software, they can play around with it in terms of alterations and process it automatically. No one else can do that. It is so much easier to do business with us because we stuck to our guns despite being threatened with we're not going to support you. Um, in terms of electronic applications, there's a lot of talk in our industry about that's the next wave of, of automation. You create an electronic application so that the advisor sits in front of the client, types all the health details and the name and address details and everything into the system, and it sucks into your back office system. Effectively, what you are saying is we are going to make the advisor who's trying to have a sales conversation with a customer our admin person, right? We're going to push it out to them. Great. First of all, they're really terrible at typing, uh, so accuracy is really bad. And secondly, they don't want to do that. It gets in the way of their communication with their customer. And we heard that, and we went, OK, well, you do your handwritten stuff. Tick the boxes on the application form while you talk with the client, because it's not a screen in front of you. It's a piece of paper that you can talk to. You do it the way you want to do it. And when it hits us, we'll turn it into an electronic application for our sake. So we use OCR and a whole bunch of smart technology, so a handwritten application is automated as soon as it hits our end. We haven't upset our advisors, but we've got the same efficiency that we would have got otherwise. Um, and finally, in terms of service levels, we decided that we would be consistent and we would deliver an acceptable turnaround time to our distributors, which was a huge change of headset for me, because every other company, I decided that we would be the best in service. We would give them the fastest turnaround. We would be 24-hour turnaround. 
And that was great when you can do it, and the minute you couldn't, you were absolutely slammed. You disaffected a whole bunch of people, and it cost a lot of money to get that extra service. So we took the decision that we'd be acceptable, but we'd be consistent, and we'd have great people. We'd have great people. So we don't have the best service. We just have a consistent level of service that we know we can consistently deliver. And we win the Beaton Survey every year. Here's some of the ways that the tactics we decided on in the early years had to change. And some of them had to change rapidly as a result of a hurdle or an opportunity. When you grow 460% faster than you think you are going to, that's a challenge, right? Because you have to build the infrastructure of the business really fast. All the things that you would normally take time to get to as your business matures, like compliance <laughs> and, and all of those kinds of things, suddenly you're a big business from day one. You need to build them all. You need to focus on running as fast as you can, not only to keep up with the business and keep it coming in, but also to build the shoulders of the organisation that's going to support that. When we started to take off, we had a capital strain issue. We don't reinsure our medical business, and that means we pay all of those commissions up front on our own. So you pay out an awful lot of commission before you get any premium from the client. And we got halfway through our second year, and we realised we couldn't afford to pay the commissions that we were paying on the medical business because we couldn't raise capital fast enough uh, to do so. We took the scary decision to change our commission structure on our medical policies and to tell our advisors why we were doing it, and we were 18 months old. The risk is enormous, right? You really are risking that you turn off everything that you've just built. We knew we would lose some business, but we backed ourselves to be able to keep our advisors, our distributors with us because the product and the client value proposition was too hard to sell against. And fortunately for us, that is what transpired. But I can tell you that was a blooming scary <laughs> communication to be sending out to our advisors at that time. We are regulated by the Reserve Bank. There was no regulation when we licensed in 2010. So we have a new regulator who didn't understand and hadn't had any experience in our industry. And they were deciding what you need for solvency as a life insurer. And we were using a funding source called reinsurance financing, and they said, we don't know whether we like this yet or not. So we're considering this, and we'll come back to you. <laughs> Fairly scary, so we thought, okay, we'll raise capital just in time because they're about to make this decision. So this year we'll just raise this much capital from a very constrained audience because we've got this big uncertainty around our business model. And next year we'll be able to widen it. Four years it took them. Four years, and every year we would get a, oh no, we're still consulting, we expect to have an answer in X number of months, so we'd raise more just-in-time capital, just-in-time, seriously, capital, on the basis that we would have certainty next year. Four years it took. We finally got certainty. I think the answer is fantastic. But we had to restructure our business to cope with just-in-time capital and to figure out where you get just-in-time capital from when you are in an uncertain environment. Um, and that was a hell of a challenge, one that I've never had to deal with before, and I, God, hope I never have to deal with <laughs> again. Uh, we, we are a new business, we're a financial services business and the credit rating agencies will not give you an A credit rating until you are at least five years old. Maybe not then either, but you can't get one until you are five years old. That gave our competitors mana from heaven to compete with us, right? They've only got a B credit rating, which by the way is pretty good, B++, but it's only a B credit rating, how can you trust them? They won't be around they're going to be run out of town, you know, there's something dodgy about them because of that credit rating. And we had to learn to deliver messages to counter that and to talk about us and why they, are, they should be comfortable with us. And that was a challenge, but it was something we rose to, clearly. We also had competitor reaction I just talked about, and we had some emerging 
worldwide claims experience in our trauma product, and the standard answer to embed the uh, diverse, a diversification of experience versus ex expected is you reprice, you charge customers more, which has a whole lot of flow-on effect to customer retention and affordability and all of those sorts of things. We had the same experience, but we took a different view. How else do we deal with this? We created new product, new alternative product that did the job that customers needed it to do, but didn't have the risks of the current trauma product, and we priced it significantly cheaper. So what we did is offer an alternative. We didn't take away trauma, we just offered an alternative. And our book of business is shifting away from trauma and into this other product where we don't have the claims experience issue. And we didn't have to significantly increase the price on the trauma product to achieve what we wanted to achieve. The real key is to recognise when you're facing a hurdle or an opportunity that requires you to change, right? Because there's lots of hurdles and opportunities, but they don't necessarily mean you need to change. But then you have to decide on the direction you're going to follow from now on. So the culture of the organisation is critical in terms of facilitating that rapid, sustainable change of direction. One of the key things to driving that culture is be careful who you recruit. Be careful you don't recruit industry experts or personalities that are known in the industry that are only capable of recreating what they already know. Because that's the fastest way to cripple an entrepreneurial organisation. I also need to say board agility is also a really important piece of that. That they have to be brave enough to back or to, to, to chance something, rather than just expecting to back something that has happened before, yeah? Prove to me that this has worked before. Doesn't work in an entrepreneurial organisation like ours where nothing we do has been done before. That's the point of being the company that we are. And finally, you really also need to challenge yourself. My biggest fear is that I become the dinosaur that gets in the way of the unicorn, yeah? That I stop, and I just want to create what's comfortable for me, or I can't see past what I already know. That's my biggest fear, and that is something you have to be conscious of as the founder of a business, that you don't stop the organisation from being everything that it could be. So to reiterate, for us, our long-term plans are centred around the things we plan for the long term. Uh, why are we needed? Who will we be? And what will we do? Our fluid plans, so we don't call them strategic plans. Well, we probably do, but I don't mean it in that sense. Our fluid plans are how are we going to achieve the why, the who, and the what. So resilience, adaptability, restlessness, curiosity, agility, creativeness. These are the organisational behaviours that enable a business to maintain a degree of fluidity in their tactical plans. The key questions for Partners Live is not what are our competitors doing, but how are we going to compete with who we were yesterday? Yeah? To disrupt today's market, to disrupt it, takes a one-off attack, right? But to avoid then being disrupted in the future, requires a company to keep disrupting itself. What form that disruption takes in all likelihood cannot be anticipated today. Yeah, but when it reveals itself to the company, your company has to be agile enough and brave enough to change directions. That means everything you plan today might be completely redundant tomorrow, and you need to be okay with that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, I'm on. Uh, that, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, now, I'm sure we've got questions from the floor, we do. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I was just wondering, what was the stance that you took when you sent out the communique to the advisors 
um, that you change that commission structure. Yeah. So was it, we're awesome and this is what we're going to do, or no. was it, hey guys, we need your help here? It's exactly what it was. It was, hey guys, here's the situation we didn't anticipate. Couldn't have anticipated. Thanks to you, <laughs> we've got this problem of success, right? Here's what we're going to do about it and here's why that's good for you, mm. right? Um, and in fact, I think all of the advisors that came through with us will now tell you they really like getting much higher renewal commissions on that, that portion of their business, but they wouldn't have done it without us making that change, yeah? yeah. So yeah, that's exactly right. We have always been completely honest with our, with our partners about where we're at and what's happening for us. Cool, thank you. Other questions? Oh good, I've got my <laughs> chance to ask mine. When I did some background uh, research into Naomi, I, I discovered that she has a special interest in developing character courses for people starting out in their careers. I want to know more about it. Um, you know, we're a life insurance business, so um, unfortunately, one of the things that you see over 33 years in the business is a lot of people who reach their middle age, particularly men, and kill themselves, um, or alternatively, are bitter. Um, and a lot of it is around my life isn't what I thought it would be. You know, that, that when I set out when I was 19 and had all these ambitions for what I wanted to be, and I, I'm here at 45 or 50, and I hate my life, and I don't know why that's happened to me. And all those years of managing and leading people, you, you can see for a number of people why they get the reaction that they get. They can't see it, but you can. And... And so I guess I've created, I've developed this passion for um, being able to talk to people about if you're not getting the reactions that you want or expect to get, then here's deconstructing it to understand why. And it's about behaviours, not about personality. So it's not about changing who you are, it's changing what you do and what you say for different audiences if you don't like the reaction that you continually get. So for me, I don't actually care if I change one person. What I care about is I get those learnings out and provide people with the ability to say, not why is this happening to me, but I know why it's happening to me and I can do something about it if I want to. And, if, you know, and, if, if, and, and, and then I'll be satisfied if I can get that out. What form that takes, I don't know. Some of my people are here and um, they've heard me practice it <laughs> on, 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 on my staff. And the feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. So I know that people get something out of it, but I don't yet know how to deliver that. I just know it's my next step once partner's life is in good hands. So can you tell us any, mo any more about the how? Um, I'm not sure if it's a book, I'm not sure if it's courses, I'm not sure if it's a, because how do you get people to come that can't already see in themselves that the reason that the things are happening to them are as a result of their own behaviours. Um, but perhaps if you talk to them about, you know, if the world is not behaving the way you think it should, <laughs> come and learn why. <laughs> um, I don't know how to get that message out. But I do know the more I talk about it, the more people say, hey, we need that in this space or we need that in this space. And so I, I just know when I'm ready, um, the opportunity in terms of how it should get out there will present itself. Sounds like a whole different career and a whole different business proposition. Any other questions? One over the back there. We've got a mic coming. Hi, um, you've obviously disrupted um, life insurance. I'm just interested if you have a plan to disrupt other aspects of insurance out in the marketplace. Um, again, I think that that opportunity is not in front of us today. We're still building this template life insurance business. There's a lot of opportunity still in that space uh, for us. Um, but we have plans to list on the stock exchange to raise further capital that then gives you opportunity. Yeah, to, to pursue another door that might open. So it's an opportunity, but also an op uh, there's opportunities in other markets, not only, you know, as well as opportunity in other product lines. So I don't know. I'm just excited about what that might be, to be honest. Really excited. Yeah. Right. Well, look, thank you so much. Um, and I'm sure we're, we're all pretty uh, amazed with what you've done and, uh, and, and the challenge, really, that you've put out in terms of... Um, creating um, a responsible 
uh, responsive business and su sustainable business proposition. And most of all, I think disrupting what, what's actually the, the, the traditional model out there. So congratulations and thank you, thank you very much thank you. on behalf of everyone.